All right, part three. Now, before I get into this video here, uh, let me address uh, these comments. Uh, first of all, BRL says, I think he was referring to the birth to his ascension up heaven being the first coming, and the second one is when he takes the people of God Almighty and deals with the sinners. Okay, so he's referring to uh, when I, I brought this up in, the, in part two, when Alex MES says, the thousand years are the period in which Satan is held back after the first judgment at the coming of Jesus, between the first and second coming. All right, so that, that, that would be to suggest that when Jesus, when baby Jesus was here, there was a judgment, and then there's coming a second judgment, and it, it's nonsensical, it's not supported by the Bible, and, it's, and it would nullify the first judgment, and um, it just doesn't make any sense. If you just connect the dots and realize, hey, there's not two judgments, there's not three, four, ten, twenty-four judgments, there's one judgment the great day of the Lord judgment day all right and um, so I, I would like it Alex MES to clarify or to uh, reconsider now um, also uh, Robo says the coin with the I that is probably because letter J was not invented then well the letter J has always been there it's always been part of the eye and then there there was this need for a separation to distinguish the sound but uh, that's a different topic so and so it's just uh, food for thought is in my you know that this idea did they add a thousand years to me it's just food for thought so and then uh, Scott Merrill um, just sort of uh, no context replies and uh, shares this link here the plot against the church take a quick look at this universal church tells me that's a cast to the immaculate heart of the virgin mary mother of god to saint joseph protector of the universal church saint michael on and on supernatural green little men from mars and uh, catholic church's teacher order so, <clears throat> easygoing weakness of the Catholics, and um, the plot against the church, and you see, uh, you start to see, uh, you know, free Jewish Freemasonry, Jewish, Jewish striving for power, anti-Semitism in Christianity. Um, the Jews kill Christians and persecute the apostles. The Romans persecutions were caused by the Jews. So far, that's true. Except, uh, it's not entirely true. But, uh, unless we're there, we can't really say. Huh? Jewish conspiracies punished with slavery. Alright, so a lot of interesting topics here. And, um... Popes and saints combat the Jews. Uh, so the popes and the Roman Catholics are anti Semitic, apparently. Um, and to me, this is interesting because we see a lot of this where the Roman Catholic Church will try to lay the blame. Of all evil on the Jews or on anything other than them own selves and Revelation 17 is talking about the Roman Catholic Church Daniel the fourth beast is about the Roman Catholic Church in fact the beast in all of Revelation is the Roman Catholic Church so it's not surprising to see agents of the Catholic Church coming out and presenting these thoughts and ideas that they are not the Antichrist, that they are not the beast of Revelation and the fourth beast of Daniel. So anyway, I just want to share that. And I don't know what ha this has to do with the letter J, the letter I, the thousand years, or nothing. But 
that's out of the way. Now let's move on. And I will raise up them a plan of renown, and they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen. This verse gives the promise of a new plant that will grow abundantly throughout the entire earth, that will cause famine to never again plague the earth, a plant of renown. Verse 30, Thus shall they know that I am the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. This verse gives the promised spiritual blessings of a living relationship with the Lord. The blessings during this time will be unparalleled. It will unparalleled any blessings since Adam was created. We could sure use some blessings now in this chaotic world, couldn't we? The blessings we'll receive are physical security, good weather, abundant fruitage, political peace, no more famine, <clears throat> and a spiritual blessing of living a relationship with Jesus. Ezekiel 36, 35, and 36. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, built the ruined places and plant that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. This future kingdom will have the beauty and splendor compared to the Garden of Eden. Notice that there was there that there will still be what the Lord considers heathen nations. This means that not all the heathen nations will be destroyed at the Lord's coming. There will be a... <clears throat> no, that's, this is the part that is nonsensical. The idea that there are going to be unsaved people living after the return of Jesus. What's the point of him returning and judging the world He's going to let people live that are not saved. So you're going to have people who are transformed into their glorified bodies that will never perish. And then at the same time, you're going to have sinners sinning it up. Just going willy-nilly with their sins. That's not paradise for us. That's not paradise for them. It makes no sense at all. It, it's And it's... How is that really? It's barely any different than what's going on now. And what you're saying is that the end of the world is not coming, that Jesus Christ is a liar. Jesus says when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. He was asked specifically, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he finalizes it or finishes it by saying that he will come in the clouds of heaven the sun shall be darkened the moon shall not give her light the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven which is Jesus make no mistake about that and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is the end of the world. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That's the end of the world, folks. There is no more second chances okay you've heard of these movies like the left behind series and, and all it's nonsense there is no more opportunity for the unsaved to be saved it is the end of the world and jesus was asked what shall be the sign of thy coming in of the end of the world and this is what jesus tells us so either jesus is telling the truth or he's a liar and this guy's telling the truth. It's up to you who you want to believe.
the remnant left to rebuild their nations. Notice also that the Lord himself will rebuild the cities that have been destroyed. Also, so, I mean, the New Testament makes us uh, as clear as it, the New Testament makes us more clear than the Old Testament. Okay, the Old Testament, there's nothing wrong with it, it but the New Testament gives us a lot clearer picture. All right, let not your heart be troubled. You believe God, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know okay this this is consistent with everything that we've read in the Bible Jesus has ascended up to heaven and he's preparing a place for us and he's gonna come back to get us and that new place is a new Jerusalem a new city a new holy city of God and that's gonna be here on earth where there's a new heaven and a new earth all right there's not going to be, when he comes back, fellas, look, it's not going to be partly, um, you know, partly, you know, I don't even know how to say this. We, right now we have saved people and we have unsaved people living together. Just like the parable that um, let them grow together, you know, the parable of the wheat and the tares. And... <laughs> When, he, you know, the master is, he's asked, should we, should we, uh, you know, tear up the tares now? And the master says, let's see. Now, surely you guys know this, right? Uh, but while men slept, I don't know it, so what am I talking about? But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the weaves and went his way. Um, but then, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? And he said, The enemy has done this. And the servant said, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And uh, the, the master said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Now the harvest is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the world. That's when the separation is made from the wheat and the tares, from the saved and the unsaved. There's just no way to get around it. When you take this parable into consideration it does not square with this idea of a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ where you're having um, saved people who are changed remember this stuff cannot contradict one another in a moment in the twinkling of night at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed when the Lord Jesus comes in the air or comes or comes in the clouds of heaven that's the end of the world the last trump we are changed forever right so you can't have this idea that well you know the idea just is just so nonsensical I can't even hardly talk about it. <clears throat> really it's so what you're saying is that you're gonna have uh, the Lord Jesus coming in the air and those of us that are saved are gonna be changed and then the unsaved are gonna get a second chance one last chance while we're in our uh, incorruptible bodies 
there's going to be zombies running around just willy-nilly committing sin and doing whatever they want. Meanwhile, we're the, those of us that are saved, we're, well, we're just going to sit back and laugh at them. It, you know, it just doesn't make any sense at all. If, if those guys saw the glory of God coming in the clouds of heaven, and they seen the evidence with their own eyes that we that are saved are transformed into our glorified, incorruptible bodies that will never perish. We can never die. Right, what more evidence would they need if they seen all that? Well, they could just believe. And it, well, why don't they believe now? Is the is a greater question. If they see that, would they even believe then? And if they wouldn't believe then, if they saw everything that they saw, the Lord coming and all of us change, and they still won't believe, what's the point of having them around for another thousand years? All right, it, it's this it's a zombie apocalypse worldview you watch too many zombie movies and you agree with this that I'm I'm telling I, I, I don't know I don't know why anybody believes this nonsense it there's no mention of Jesus Christ reigning a thousand years anyway anywhere in the Bible so all right let me drink my coffee so that he will plant the deserts Get out of here, bug. And deserts and cause them to bloom. Ezekiel 47, 8. Then said he unto them, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the deserts, and go into the sea. Which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. From the temple in Jerusalem, a river of living water will flow through the desert to the Dead Sea. And the water in the Dead Sea will be healed. What does it mean that the waters will be healed? Ezekiel 47 9. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live, and where shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall be live within the within the river cometh. The Dead Sea receives its name because of the salt content of the sea. No fish can survive there at this point in time. The sea will be cleansed of all the salt, whereas a great multitude of fish can thrive. Zechariah 14.8 And I shall be in that day... Right. Zechariah 14.8 let me, let me find it first. Zechariah 14.8 Why do I always have a problem finding Zechariah? Zechariah Why Why am I always having a problem finding Zechariah 14.8 Zachariah or is it Zechariah? I don't know. Day that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them to the former sea, half of them to the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. The supply of water from Jerusalem will be constant throughout the entire year. This is literally this is literal as well as symbolic. Water will heal the sea, and a multitude of fish will live in the sea. Water is also used symbolically throughout the Old Testament to indicate purification and refreshment. The point of the symbolism is that when Jesus returns, spiritual purification and refreshment will be spread throughout the land. Okay. <clears throat> So no, he's right, and, and look, I'm not saying that really that anything he's saying is wrong, except uh, the things that he's describing is what happens after the return of the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the resurrection, or this is the time of 
uh, the, the new world, right? The new heaven and the, the new earth. This is not a thousand year period. Okay, so basically what him and uh, the others are teaching is that this period that he's talking about where there's no more sin, no more, or well, I don't know what he's, if he's even saying that, where there's no more death, no more sorrow, no more suffering. And the earth will be healed and all that sort of stuff. He, what he's saying is th this, that's only a thousand year period. It's coming to an end. And then what? It goes back to the way it is now or even worse? What? It doesn't make any sense at all. When Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new, this is not a temporary deal. This is everlasting life. All right, so what was he talking about here? About the waters. Um, the and what's Jesus say about, uh, oh, what am I doing here? A well of water springing up. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life so and that's not coming that's going to be right now the day that you believe in the day that you're born of the spirit of god that water is in you and you'll never thirst you'll never hunger you'll never um you know you'll never die you have everlasting life Zechariah 14, 16, and 17. All right. Now, <clears throat> I don't know why that bothers me. Zechariah. I mean, he's probably right, but for some reason in my mind, I'm thinking Zechariah. 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 Nah, he's probably right. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the king and the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So there will be a remnant of the people left from the nations that go against the city of the Lord during the battle of Megiddo. <clears throat> the battle of Megiddo. The battle of Megiddo. The battle of Megiddo. All right. Megiddo. 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 How do you spell Megiddo? Maget Megiddo? Megiddo. Right there it is. Megiddo. Alright, the Battle of Megiddo. Battle of Megiddo. Battle of Megiddo. There it is. Megiddo. <clears throat> okay. The, the Battle of Megiddo. Battle of Megiddo. What's battle? What's he talking about here? Um. Well, I don't know where where is he coming up with that Battle of Megiddo? At the end of the tribulation period. At the end of the tribulation period. All right. So. Okay, this I'm gonna cut this one. It's been 15 minutes. Um, this will be the end of part three. Like I said, I'm gonna do five minute uh, segments here. And um, so if we go, you know, I'm just gonna stick and hammer this home until somebody says, "Hey, maybe I ought to read Matthew 24," right? Because um, this is incredible stuff. It really is. Immediately after the tribulation, the end of the world. 
All right, you can you can go on and on as long as you think you can and ignore the fact that this is the end of the world immediately after the tribulation the end of the world you can try to fool people you fool yourself but it's not changing the word of god and it's the, the truth is going to is going to play out all right so this is going to happen just as the Bible says, no matter it, if nobody believes it, it doesn't matter, it's still going to happen. You can't change the truth. You can't change the Word of God. God has a plan, and He's going to stick to it, whether you believe it or not. All right, stay tuned for part four.